you know, over the past month, maybe a little bit longer, we've been on this series about the invitation of the Jesus life. And one of the things that I want to continue just to remind us is that living the Jesus life is more than just accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior. That's a very important part of, uh, of who we are and, and what we are to do. But living the Jesus life is living, as you've heard me say it time and time again, quoting a mentor of mine from uh, college, James Bryan Smith, is that we live as one in whom Christ dwells and delights. I pray that that could be a prayer that you have, is that, that we are to live as one in whom Christ dwells and delights. And to remember that, that as we live as one in whom Christ dwells and delights, that we live in God's unshakable kingdom. And in the world that we live in right now, we need to remember that God's kingdom is never in trouble, and neither are we. God's kingdom is never in trouble. It says we live in that unshakable kingdom, neither are we. So what do we do? We, 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 we try to live our lives as, as Jesus lived his life, and that means that we are attentive listeners. We have compassion with heart, and, and, and that it flows allows us to, to, to live in, in tough times, but have a tender heart. And today we look at when we have this tender heart, it allows us to cheerfully go the extra mile. So before we hear our scripture, I invite you to go to God to pr in prayer with me. Let us pray. Oh God, we pray that you allow us to see you, to, to allow your spirit to, to fill this room right now so that we hear your words, so that, so that when we leave this place, we, we don't see it as a box that we've checked off, but we leave this place knowing that we have heard your word. And that we go to live that, that live in that invitation that you give us day after day to live in your kingdom. So God, we pray that you let the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart here be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, by strength and by redeemer. Amen. So our scripture for today. It is one from Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 38. And I invite you to follow along in your Bibles. If you don't have your Bibles, we'll have the words printed up on the screen for you. So hear the word of the Lord. Jesus is speaking, and he says, But to you who are listening, I say, Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on the cheek, turn to them to the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expected to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. 
Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, for me, this is one of those passages that, that when, I, when I read it or, or when I hear it, I, I, I understand it, and, and I, I can nod along and, and amen here or there and say, oh, yeah, definitely, yeah, we, that's what, that is exactly what you need to do. But when it comes to the moment that we realize that we are the ones that, that Jesus is talking to, we may stumble. Okay, wait a minute. Let me be clear. I stumble. I stumble because I, I don't want to do these things. I want everybody else to do it. But when it comes to me doing these things, I, I don't want to do it. I don't want to turn the other cheek. I would much rather lash out in anger so people could see my, my righteous indignation. I don't want to give my shirt whenever somebody takes my coat because I don't want to be naked in front of anybody. I don't want to see somebody take something of mine and, 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 and release it, knowing that I will never see it back because I've worked hard for that. I've worked hard for it, and it is mine. But the two things with this passage, before we could just move on. The first one, I, I love how Jesus opened up this passage. But to you who are listening, I say. That's funny. That just, that just cracks me up every single time I, I, I read that passage. Because Jesus knew that in that time, as he was giving these teachings, that people weren't listening. They were plotting. They were preparing. They were wanting to do anything and everything they could to stop the Son of Man from completing his mission on earth. And then to go at the very end of that passage, for what with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Are we grateful? Are we thankful? Do we go the extra mile because we know that is what Christ has called us to do? Or do we step back saying, I've done my turn. I've done all that I want to do so somebody else could step up and take over now. I admit, I stumble with that all the time. But, but here's the good news. Jesus never stumbled. His entire life on earth, and, and as he continues to sit there at the right hand of God, interceding for us, Christ never stumbles. And you would think, the one time that Christ could have stumbled, he didn't, and that was when he hung on the cross when he gave his life up for us. I, I used to think about those, those seven words that, that Christ gave on the cross. The very first three words that are attributed to him while he was hanging on there was to serve other people. It was there for the good of others. First by saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing for the good of us who sin. Then he said to the thief that was hanging next to him, truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. Not just saying you're, you're going to heaven today, but you are going to be there right in the middle of the courtyard alongside of me. That was for the good of the thief. 
And the third time is when he placed his mother Mary in the care of the disciple John, both benefiting both John and Mary. Mary having somebody to, to take care of her and, and to, to be with her as she continues to grow old. And John, because, well, John was a little hot-tempered. And he knew that, that Mary would be there to help guide him and to lead him as he continued to grow and as he continued to, to help the church grow. So you may be thinking to yourself, now, now Pastor Chris, come on. It's easy to know who is an enemy. It's easy to know who it is that, that wants to harm you, but really, I, I don't have an enemy. There, there, there is no one that I can think of right now who, who is looking to do me harm. But, you know, we all have a person or persons that we find difficult during the day and who we could possibly like a little bit more. You know, I remember growing up, there was a, a guy uh, that, that I went to school with in elementary school. His name, his name was also Chris. And, man, we were at each other's throats almost every day of sixth grade. I mean, I, I, I wasn't a bully, but I wanted to be a bully. Um, and he, he was just a lot stronger than me, and I just wouldn't back down. And we would get into fights. We would get into scuffles. We would say things to each other during class. Finally, our teacher had enough, so he called my mom and dad and called Chris's mom and dad and said, y'all get together and you, you, you deal with this. So we went over to, the, to Chris's house, and we sat there. And Chris's dad said some very, very wise words. And I don't think it's happened ever since, but, you know, he said, what I want you to do is to go through the newspaper and look at what happens in Washington, D.C. And if you could find me a story where the politicians of D.C. had a fist fight to, to, to settle a difference, let me know and I'll give you $100. Well, I didn't hear what he said beforehand. I heard fight Washington, D.C., $100. So I went home, and I, I grabbed all of the extra newspapers that I could find, and I started to go through all of them. And I, I was getting frustrated because I could not see of, of politicians getting into a fist fight there in Washington, D.C., and my mom looked at me and said, you just don't get it. They, they don't fight. At least not there. I mean, verbal stuff. I mean, of course, we know now there's a whole lot of verbal stuff that's going on that needs to be cleaned up. But that, that, that moment where I realized that, that a politician is called to serve. We, as followers of Jesus Christ, we are called to serve. And that means at time that we are called to, to cheerfully go the extra mile when we don't even want to. Where we turn the other cheek. Where we give up our shirt when our coats have been taken. When we love those who don't love us. When we do good to those who aren't good to us. But there's good news about this, my friends. This is something we don't have to do on our own. I, I think one of the reasons why we don't want to do that is because, well, I don't have the energy and I really don't want to do anything for somebody who dislikes me. But the fact of the matter is, is that when we try to do that ourselves, we are definitely going to fail. All we have to do is to keep our hearts and minds focused on Jesus. Jay Johnson said it this way, diligently keeping one's heart right as each difficult situation comes up enables us to live an eternal life with God now, every minute. 
When, when we have a, a right heart and when we have a focused heart, when we have a compassionate heart, it allows us to see that, that we are not just living our lives day after day after day by ourselves, but we are living our lives, an eternal life with God every minute of the day. God is with us. Even when times are difficult, even, even when we want, even if we struggle, even when somebody curses you. You know, I think the help, there are some passages that, that I go to whenever I think about these things. To know that, that Christ is with me, that, that Christ guides me and, and leads me. The first one is from John fifteen five, as Jesus is talking about being grafted into the vine. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Remain in me and I in you. You will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. What must we do? We must remain in Christ. And allow Christ to remain in us. And then we can move through any situation that we have and thinking and giving thanks that we could cheerfully go the extra mile. And then as Philippians 4.13 reminds us that I can do all things because of Christ who strengthens me. You all remember where that, that was written. Paul was in prison. Paul was in prison, shut away from the rest of the believers. And, and as he's sitting there in prison, he reminds them that it doesn't matter what you are going through because I can do all things because of Christ who strengthens me. So, so what does that look like? A little practical ways to think about that. You may have heard of the phrase, pray as you can. That's something that we talk about, that sometimes you feel like you must have a, a very strong and worthy prayer life, but when you sit down to pray to God, you realize that nothing is going to come out. That's just a time where you can just say what you can. It may be a simple prayer, hey God, it's me, amen. I've prayed that prayer before. When, when I, I have, feel like I have nothing else to say and there's nothing else that I could do, I just say, hey, God, it's me. Amen. Because I know God knows exactly what I, what I need. It could be lifting up a couple of petitions, a couple of petitions that you feel are just this small and insignificant, but it's just doing what you can. And that goes with cheerfully walking or going the extra mile. It could be under your breath saying, Lord, please be with me or be with this extremely difficult person right now. And I'll admit that's one of my favorite prayers. Whenever I have a problem with somebody, I say, God, I, I can't deal with this. I can't handle them, but I know you can. So just watch over them. Let them feel your presence. Or maybe it's taking the opportunity to pray, to ask God to show you something doable. He may not be able to do much, but, but there may be just one little thing that you could do. At a previous church, I had a staff member that drove me absolutely nuts. She would, she would come and stand at my office door and just stare at me. And I, I would try to pretend like I was doing something else, but she would sit there and she would there she was. And then when I would look up, she would go, <sighs> and then she would turn and walk away. I'm like, what in the world was that? Tracy and I would talk about it at home all the time. Yep, she did it again. I don't know what's up with her, but she did it again. But then I realized that she needed something. I didn't know what it was. I, I, I had no idea what it was that I could do to help her. So I found ways to help her out. 
she was not a very clean person around the office either. Or I would notice that there was stuff that was lying around that she would leave like in the sanctuary or in the office or something like that. So I would take the opportunity to just kind of straighten things up for a little bit. Or if I noticed something in the sanctuary that, that she left, I would, I would pick it up and I would take it to her. And she was always so grateful whenever I did that. But it, it, it did something to my own heart realizing that my opportunity to, to bless this staff person kind of freed me up. It freed me up to not worry about whatever she was standing there in front of my office, just going, <sighs> but it helped me to see her as a daughter of the king. It helped me to see her as a beloved child of God. It helped me with the opportunity to, to let go and to put down the barriers that, that I put up and loved her as Christ has loved her. Cheerfully going the extra mile is, is difficult. Cheerfully going the extra mile is something that, that we all have to work on. And whenever I say we all have to work on, I think you all know that I'm, I'm talking about this guy right here more than I'm talking about any of you in this room. But when we turn the other cheek, when we bless those who hurt us, when we know that we could do all of these things because we are in Christ. We could share the love of Christ in a, a deeper and more compassionate way so that others may see Christ and not us. So we have some spiritual practices for you to look at this week. And, and one is... A uh, simple prayer to receive the greatness of the Spirit of God is to thank God for all the ways that God has gone out of his way for you this past week. And as I was putting this together, I can always count all the ways that I know that God has gone out of his way for me this week. But then to celebrate. Ask God to show you a person who needs a little celebration that you can provide. Ask God to show you how you might serve a difficult person in your life. And then, with a quick, silent prayer, how might you pray to bless each person that you pass by today? Not, not going out of the way, not saying anything, but just say just a blessing for each person that you may drive by, that you may walk by, that you may just have a, a, a brief moment with and allow that to help you to walk and to cheerfully go the extra mile with someone. Let us pray. Oh God, as we continue to find ways to, to live into this invitation, give us your word. Give us your grace. Give us your power. Because, Lord, we know that apart from you, we can do nothing. Apart from you, we, we are left to our own devices. That our own devices could hurt instead of heal. Our, our own devices could pull apart instead of build up. Our own devices allows us the opportunity to to dislocate or, or, or to disengage while with you in our lives. You knit us together to be the body of Christ that you have called us to be. That's Lord, we lift this prayer up to you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.